There are one million misconceptions out there in the reef aquarium hobby. There are so many opinions that it can be hard to know how to filter out the noise. I'm no expert, but I am a mermaid, so I think I know my way around the ocean. But for real, I'm here to give you my opinion based on my experience in the hobby and working at three different fish stores across a five year span, learning from many other experienced aquarists. Flex, not trying to flex. If you don't want to listen to me, that's fine. You can kiss my ass. <laughs> totally kidding, but I will be having a guest come on later in the video to give his opinion on a couple of topics as well. All right, let's dive right into it. But before we do, I wanted to share this horrendously funny joke that I totally did not just steal from Reef Central. So I'm going to share it with you now. Okay, what is Coral's favorite music show? Live rock. Uh, okay, fine. Let's get to the less cringy stuff. The first misconception deals with some people's belief that a mixed reef tank is easier than a tank with only one group of coral in it. If you're not following yet, mixed reefs usually consist of two or three out of the three groups of coral. That being soft coral, large polyp stony, and small polyp stony. I'm going to argue that keeping a mixed reef can be more difficult than if you chose only one type of coral to put in your tank. This is because each category of coral has different environmental factors, such as lighting, flow, and nutrients. So when you put all these corals in a small ecosystem, it's difficult to make everyone happy at the same time. It might mean that nobody is fully happy or that everyone's okay, but they could be doing better if it was a specific type of coral tank. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a mixed reef. I think they're the coolest kind of reef you can build and I've enjoyed keeping a few myself. I drool over SPS reefs, but I personally like to have some sort of LPS or something else than just pretty sticks. So what I recommend for you if you don't already have a reef but you want to set one up is to do your research and decide what corals you like. Do you like movement or color and rarity? Are you willing to do a water change once a week? Or are you too busy to have that much of a commitment? Are you okay spending a fortune on expensive equipment? Or do you want a low cost, simple setup? After deciding what group or groups of coral you want in your reef, you can then build your tank with those animals in mind. The second misconception is that you need top of the line lighting for your reef. This is partially true, partially false. And here's why. Lighting is generally the most costly piece of equipment for a reef tank. However, you don't have to get super high-end lights if you're keeping only soft corals and maybe some LPS. If you like SPS, then you're gonna have to bite the bullet and spend some big bucks, my friend. But don't worry, that's only the start of the addiction. I mean hobby. I meant to say hobby. So let's go over the damage and see what you might be getting yourself into. The lowest cost reef lights are usually around $200. Those would include the current USA Orbit LED, Aquamax LED, or a T5 fixture, although those cost you more in the end since you have to switch out the bulbs periodically. On the high end are the Ecotech Radions, which run around $800. These essentially have computers in them, so there are seemingly endless things you can do with them. In between the classy and the ratchet lights, I'm just kidding, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Are Aqua Illumination and Kessels, which are typically around the three to four hundred dollar mark. Just know that you usually get what you pay for when it comes to lighting and just about anything else. In the past, I ran a six bulb T5 fixture on my 150 gallon reef and got really good color and growth from my corals. I switched over to keeping nano tanks and my 25 gallon lagoon has an AI Hydra 26 on it, which I really enjoy. I would personally recommend AI lights if you want to keep any type of coral and you want some control Controllability at a price that won't make your significant other walk out the door. So in conclusion, you might need a fancy light if you want SPS corals, but you don't necessarily need one if you're growing mainly soft corals. First decide on what type of coral you want to keep and then choose your lighting accordingly. The third misconception is that you can use any type of filter for your reef tank. For those of you who have already set up saltwater tanks before, you'll know this is false, but for you newbies out there, this is important to know before setting up your system. Some aquariums like my 25 gallon Nuvo have an all-in-one filter located in the back, which is really awesome if you want to save on space and not see a bunch of clutter. What I definitely advise against using are canister filters and bio balls. Both of these things trap debris and are well known to be nitrate factories. So try a hang on the back filter if you don't have any other options available and use a porous rock media like Matrix or Biomax to help build up your bacterial colony. That leads us to misconception number four, which is that you need to buy power heads that produce random pulsating flow. Even though that would be the ideal option, power heads that produce random flow are either crazy expensive 
or come with a controller that kind of sucks. What I recommend if you're on a budget is to get cheaper power heads and point them slightly towards each other or have the output bounce off the wall so you mix the flow. Having a constant unwavering stream of flow directly on a coral is not ideal, so if you can deflect the flow off of a rock or the glass, please do. I'm not bougie enough right now to afford Vortec or Tunzi power heads, but I had three MP40s on my 150 gallon in the past and would totally get an MP10 on my Nano if I could. Just gonna leave you with something Worldwide Coral has said, which is that they believe that flow is more important than light. So just keep that in mind. All right, misconception number five is about if you need a skimmer on your reef, and if so, how big should you go? Cause you know, size matters, or does it? For aquariums under 40 gallons, I'd say you don't have to have them. Usually frequent water changes are enough. If you have a lot of fish and you're getting oil on the surface of your water, then you might want to consider one for your nano. I really think it's essential to have more than one person's opinion, so I want to bring on my friend the Baka Reefer, the Blasto King. Certainly a real life otaku and proud of it. Here's Bryce with his advice on keeping a protein skimmer on a mid-sized reef tank. Thanks for having me, Nikki. I hope I can kind of help. Well, I'm Baca Reefer. I'm only 23 years, 23 years old, college student, not really the typical reefer. I am younger, but I have about 10, 11 years of experience and working under my boss. He's been around for 30 years plus and my manager. And they've sculpted me to become a different kind of person in this hobby because I have the ideals of the new reefers and ideals of the old school reefers. And I just apply it in my own way. When it comes to skimmers, my my, my main thing is you shouldn't standardize everything in the hobby and skimmers are one of them. With the smaller tanks, as long as you do water changes, that's pretty much all you need to do. Unless you have a lot of livestock, then the skimmer helps. Keeps your nitrates, phosphates on the lower side. I kept a 10 gallon tank for about four to five years. A water change replenishes all of, all of your necessities, all the essential uh, elements of your coral need, while also keeping your tank nice and clean. While having a skimmer may keep it really, or keep it or help it be clean, it might make it too clean. And then you might have that issue, which people don't put into consideration. Everyone's pushing for those numbers that have the lowest in, the lowest nitrates, the lowest phosphates, but no one considers the corals health because they're animals, they have to eat. Like you and I, we have to eat to survive. As much as they can use a type of photosynthesis, they need nutrition in the water column. And so with that nutritional value, that's what gives them a lot of colors. With like medium to larger tanks, having a skimmer will help you, but it can sometimes be a flaw. Same as ha having a refugium. It just makes your tank cleaner that you having to do a water change every so often. But I don't really think it's a very essential need to have. Every reef is different and you gotta figure your reef out. I have a lot of friends who have who have had both running at the same time and just ended up taking it all apart because it was sucking out all the nutrients, all their coral were really pissed off. I mean my tank as of right now I don't run a skimmer. My skimmer goes on and off. I pretty much run it every few months or so. Whenever stuff hits the fan, that's when I got my skimmer running, but that's about it. For the larger tanks with heavier bio loads that should have skimmers, there is this general rule that you should get a skimmer that's rated double what your tank is. So if you have 100 gallon, then you should get a skimmer rated for 200 gallons. I used to believe this rule for a while until my coworkers said that that's kind of bullshit and that an overrated skimmer can be too efficient and take too many nutrients out of the water. But if you have a lot of SPS, isn't that a good thing? Don't you want a pretty sterile environment? Well, that brings us to misconception number six, which is that SPS likes sterile water. There is a huge hype about how to make nitrates as close to zero as possible, whether it be achieved by the use of overrated skimmers, GFO, bio pellets, or even vodka dosing. Yes, SPS do like clean tanks, but they need some sort of nutrients to be happy. In an article from reefbum.com, the author writes about dosing nitrates to improve SPS coloration. They state that you don't want to starve corals by totally depriving them of the nutrients they need to grow and thrive. They suggest that some reefers use supplements such as amino acids to feed corals, while others are finding it necessary to dirty up their tanks a bit to improve coral health. Eventually, they became a proponent of having a lot of fish and feeding them heavily to keep nitrates elevated. Fish poop is a great coral food. Who would have known? However, other measures may be necessary to raise nitrates even further. They go on about how you can dose potassium nitrate. They gradually raised their nitrates from one parts per million to five ppm and saw an improvement in the color of their SPS. It's a very interesting article. So if you wanna read the whole thing, it will be linked below in the description. I saw firsthand at the fish store I used to work at that too much equipment 
too little feeding, and large regular water changes all contributed to a couple mature SPS colonies dying within a day or two. So sterile water, it's a problem, not a solution. Okay, let's talk about live rock and how there's a misconception that is better to start out with than dry rock. So the reason why people typically buy live rock instead of dry rock is to accelerate the nitrogen cycle because the live rock usually comes with bacteria and other critters like filter feeders, sponges, macroalgae, and pods. And while some fish stores you can definitely find rock that has all of these things, most get the rock in almost dry. Then they cure it by keeping it in their rock bins. Once you get it and take it home, there's quite a bit of die-off, especially if you don't have it wrapped in soaking wet paper towels. So essentially, you're paying for the bacteria and an ammonia source because of the decaying pods and other critters on there that will die when the rock dries through transit. I will say I'm pretty biased on this topic, being that I've only bought dry rock because one, it's cheaper, Two, it has no pests, and three, you get about the same results using it in conjunction with bottled bacteria as you would if you had live rock. It usually doesn't matter what you use because it will still take you about three or so weeks to cycle your tank. So a lot of new reefers have this notion that there are these ideal parameters that they have to achieve in order to be successful. While there are good general guidelines, chasing that perfect number is the last thing you'd want to do since the inconsistency tends to stress your corals out. It's better to have your parameters stay the same even if they are a bit off than to have them always jump up and down. All right, so you have a vision reef and you've achieved brilliant results with really wacky parameters. So tell us your thoughts on that, man. Wacky is an understatement if you ask me. Oh yeah, well, I mean, your name's Baka Reefer for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Well, Baka in Japanese, depending on the context, they can go from stupid to uh, dumbass. <laughs> It also means, uh, I think yeah. it was either, I think it meant cow in Filipino or some shit. Are you calling yourself a cow? <laughs> I mean, I eat a lot of beef and I look like one, so that's good. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> good for you. I believe chasing numbers is uh, it's a waste of time, honestly. I, when I first started, I mean, I thought you had to have these perfect parameters just to keep coral alive or to have the best results. But over time, I kind of just learned that you don't, honestly. As much as people can test water every day or use the greatest test kits to figure out what your parameters are at, they're ever changing. You're never gonna get the same two results at one time. And I've seen some of the greatest tanks have some of the craziest numbers. The highest numbers I've had were my nitrates being at 80 to 100, my phosphates being around 0.75 to one, my calcium being at 650, my alkalinity being at 17, and my magnesium being at 1500. That came to me as a surprise when I was testing that time, but at the same time, my tank was doing the best it's ever done. So with that being said, those uh, parameters went up gradually over the course of give or take two or three months. Coral can adapt to change, but that change has to be over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. If you just spike numbers, that's when stuff starts going downhill and coral look pissed off. As like high as my parameters were, yeah. It didn't, really, it didn't really seem like much. I mean, the only issue with that would be if I were to acquire coral or give some of my coral off, they might not do so happy in a new environment, having to switch from my numbers to theirs, but I've never had issues and other people haven't had issues with receiving or me getting coral. I could do for my extremes, to the lowest I've seen were my boss's tanks. My boss's tanks have really low levels, like the calcium could be like, 350 and the alkaline could be at like six to seven and the SPS is still growing and thriving. It's quite crazy to think of. I think it's insane, but hey, the coral are living. You know, they got used to just being at those lower levels to trip what these corals can go through. Yeah, it is. If you gradually change over time, if you were to just jump it up, then that's, they're not going to be happy about that at all. <laughs> yeah. Much as people want to keep their parameters and everything to be like the ocean, you got to remember this is an artificial environment that we've created for them. And like no way in time will you ever see all this coral in one little spot, like just like, like our fish tanks. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. We got coral from all around the world, honestly, and, you know, they don't really care. They know they're not in the wild. Yeah. So, I mean, it's got to make the best with it. It's like, yeah, that's a good point. As much as you shouldn't standardize everything, I mean, there are basic guidelines to keeping coral, whether it's like an SPS tank. Yeah, you should keep uh, your nitrates and phosphates a little bit on the lower side, like 5 ppm of nitrates, 5 to 10, phosphates around 0.1, calcium 440, alkaline 7.8 to 8, pH, we don't really care about it, but 
salinity <laughs> 1.026. That's like the perfect world, but not everyone has the time to keep everything that perfect. And also not a lot of people have an apex system to check it every two seconds. Yeah. With an LPS tank and a softy tank, that's what I run. I keep a higher nutrient system. I've had the best results with having everything on a little bit on the higher side. I am stepping up my SPS game right now. Oh, do you? And this tank was originally going to be an SPS dominated tank, but I ended up falling in love with Blastos and it went downhill with my bank account ever since. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah, you got it's a, a little bit too crazy with those blasters. Yeah, well worth it. My favorite coral. You're like living on the street. It was so worth it. <laughs> yeah, you know, spare change for blastos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll frag for food. <laughs> I wish. Well, working at a like fish my... store, you essentially do, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> it just gets taken on my paycheck. I just come home without a paycheck, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you on that. <laughs> All right, thanks for working for me. Your boss is probably like, thanks for being an employee oh. and a customer. <laughs> All in one. <laughs> yeah, I'm the ultimate value. Yeah, there you go. Stability. Inconsistency is key to keeping a reef tank. That's about the best thing I could tell you. Get a routine going and stick to it. You gotta take your course and not someone else's course. Kinda like live your life. Amen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks, Bryce, for being on this call. It was a. Uh, it was really fun, and I hope some people learn some stuff from you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I hope people listen, but I can't tell you what to do. I'll make this really short as I'd love to do a full video on the benefits of macroalgae, but I'm going to talk about misconception number nine, which is that macroalgae is really only good for using in a refugium. Well, not everyone has this opinion. Most reefers don't really care about seaweed and only use it as a filter or food for their animals. I guess I think differently than most hobbyists as I enjoy almost every type of macroalgae there is out there and have four types in my various tanks. The most sought after types of macroalgae are catamorpha and dragon's tongue, and the rest are thought to be pests or not very useful. I use them to keep down the microalgae and as a shelter to make my fish more comfortable, but also I just think it looks cool to have different textures and colors than just corals. And the nice thing too is that you can set up a saltwater planted tank if you want to try something a little different. This seems to be becoming more and more popular as I've seen some fabulous people like Tiger Boy H2O and Salty Melon create incredible macroalgae displays. Finally, we have arrived at the last misconception, and it's gonna be the most controversial one. So buckle up and let's go. <laughs> As a general rule of thumb, doing small frequent water changes will lead to a stable, healthy reef. Although people have found success by not following this rule at all. While most people will take out 20 to 30% of their water each week or every two weeks, some people say F it and don't do any water changes for years. A customer from the store I worked at last had told me that he had not done a water change on his 300 gallon reef in two years. This wasn't by accident or magic though, he had a 200 gallon sump packed with Kato and would bring five gallon buckets of it into the store every two weeks. Well, one day he took out too much Kato and the whole tank got off balance. There was a huge dinoflagellant outbreak and everything crashed. So it's extremely hard to keep your tank on the right course without water changes unless you really know what you're doing. A better example of someone who's been successful with keeping a reef tank without doing water changes is Sanjay. He has not done one for five years on his 23 year old soft coral tank. To reach the level of maturity that it needs to be able to work without skimmers, without chemical filtration, there's a whole lot of biodiversity I think that has to establish. Yeah, it's a biology that has to develop. Right. I mean, it's, it's understanding of the system now. You know, you understand enough of the system that you can actually do these things. So unless you're really experienced and you're willing to test the limits, do small frequent water changes, especially if you have a nano or an SPS dominated reef tank. I want to give Bryce, or Baka Reefer as he's known on Instagram, a huge thank you for being a part of my first ever YouTube video and sharing his knowledge on a couple of these misconceptions in the reef aquarium hobby. Go check out his cool page as he has intriguing photos of some very rare coral. I also want to thank all my friends that let me use their beautiful Instagram photos to make this video a bit bit more interesting. They are really friendly, talented people that I hope you get a chance to check out. Lastly, I'd like to thank you for watching this video and it's been a blast to make even though it took over 9,000 hours. <sighs> please, please like, comment, and subscribe and maybe even peruse my Instagram page, That Miss Mermaid. Trust me, there is some delicious eye candy on there and I'm not just talking 
about myself. Oh my god! 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 All right, go be productive and seize the day. I'll see you in the next one. Oh my god, these jokes are actually painful. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, bye. If you're not following yet, it's okay. You have time. Walk out the. <laughs> Saying hey, Mrs. Bird is worth. No. Oh, and I'm surprised you didn't notice uh, I shaved and everything. Well, good. You look 12 years old now. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'm Baca Reaper and I'm 12. <laughs> good. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on your video, Nikki. I hope everyone knows who I am. Uh, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm like the most prestigious coral collector ever. <laughs> I want to be prestigious. But I'm not. <laughs> See, it's harder right, than always, you thought, right? I yeah, I know. It's, it's weird looking in this all. It is though, yeah. And salt water. <laughs> this seems to be. This seems to be. This seems to be. La 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 la. Oh, please, please, <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> okay. Whoa. I almost just <laughs> dropped some water. Okay.